All right. This is my, my disclosures. Sorry they weren't up there. I was as actually listed as not giving any, but there they are. Um, so the ideal T levels achieved during ADT, this is a question that has been answered actually by the Canadians. Um, in 2012, the consensus, the US Bethesda consensus recommended 20 nanograms per deciliter for serum T during ADT in patients with advanced prostate cancer, prostate cancer as levels between 20 to 50 have a poorer clinical output. Now, as I said, the Canadians answered that with their biggest trial. And also, uh, the EAU guidelines define testosterone during ADT as less than 20. The Canadian Neurologic Association consensus recommends adoption of less than 20 nanograms per deciliter as the castrate level and regular monitoring of T and PSA levels every three to six months during ADT treatment. Now, unfortunately, the European Union regulatory authorities and the FDA continue to define castrate levels for T at less than 50. And I hope I'll show you as we move through this that that's a problem. This is the data from Canada. This followed Moroti and Perichino's papers, which were small, which said that if you got down below 20, you did far better than if you were between 20 and 35, and much better if you were between 35 and 50. And this was a large randomized control trial involving over 600 patients, and it showed the very same thing. So basically, the lower you can go, the better. That question should be answered by now, okay? Now, there are common adverse effects of angin deprivation therapy. You've all heard me drone on about this for the last three or four years. But there are new things now. We have the usuals, and then you have to add to that cardiovascular disease, which I hope I'll convince you of at the end of this 10 minutes, and then liver disease, as well as all of the other problems listed here. Now, personalized ADT for the specific cancer, prostate cancer patient is real, and we need to practice that. That means we assess for cardiac problems and abnormalities. We assess for obesity and the difficulties that further testosterone deprivation will, will induce. FSH, we never talk about. Liver disease. And should we, what's the advantage of ADT if it's localized or high risk localized versus high volume metastatic disease? And how do we stage that? And then I'm going to mention docetaxel before going on ADT or after going on ADT, or both, and then newer agents and their place. Now, the American Heart Association has published and recommends that patients undergo a cardiac evaluation. This was published in circulation. It's the A, B, C, D, and E's, which are listed on this slide. As you can see, it's common sense stuff that once you see the patients, you screen them for cardiovascular disease and particularly coronary artery disease. Preliminary trials show that cardio the cardiovascular event risk with the GnRH antagonist is 50% lower than with the GnRH agonist. Okay? So let's look a bit more into cardiovascular profile and ADT. Is there a difference between agonist and antagonist? Well, if we look back at the Peter Albertson data, which was published in 2014, and this was a combination of six large trials. That was the only way they could do it because there hasn't been a randomized control trial. There's one underway. But when treated with a GnRH antagonist versus a GnRH agonist, patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease had a relative reduction of over 50% if they went on the antagonist and an absolute risk reduction of 8.2%. This is the problem. It's atheromatous plaques within the coronaries. You can see it there. And the picture on the right is actually showing you where FSH receptors are located, and they're located within the plaque. So stimulating those FSH receptors is probably not a very good thing. And when you do give ADT, you don't want to see that stimulation. You want to see an immediate reduction in testosterone. T lymphocytes are the key drivers of collagen metabolism in atherosclerotic plaques. And I've just explained to you why there's a difference, and this is what happens. Basically, you get disruption of the fibrotic cap, which results in plaque instability with an increased risk of the patient either developing a coronary artery event or an embolus somewhere else. Somewhere else. What about clinical data? Because all this is work from mice or retrospective work. So clinical data, this was a, an abstract in 2017. It was a pilot prospective randomized trial. 
It was by Dr. Margul et al. 59 patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease were randomized, 30 to the antagonist, 29 to the agonist. Bottom line was follow-up, in follow-up, 10 patients developed a new cardiovascular event, seven patients were hospitalized due to ischemic heart disease, and three suffered from a new ischemic cerebrovascular event. Nine of the 10 patients were randomized to the agonist. Within the agonist arm, patients with a lower than 40% FSH decrease were twice as likely to experience a cardiovascular event. So in summary, as regards this study, prostate cancer patients needing ADT have higher baseline cardiovascular disease characteristics and risk factors. And the question is, does it make a difference if we give an agonist or an antagonist? Or perhaps that may not make such a difference if we carry out routine assessment of these patients prior to going on ADT and they are treated prior to going on ADT. And that is a study which is embedded in the radicals trial in Canada and we will have an answer to it. This is a randomized control trial which was published in the Journal of Urology in 2019 by Dr. Margul, or Professor Margul. It was cardiovascular morbidity in a randomized trial comparing the agonists versus the antagonists among patients with advanced prostate cancer and pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Phase two randomized open label study, 80 men, randomized half to GNRH agonists, half to the antagonists for a year. New cardiovascular events developed in 15 patients. 20% of the patients randomized to the GNRH agonist experienced a major event versus 3% in the antagonist arms. The absolute risk reduction at 12 months using the antagonist was 18.1%. So patients treated with an agonist experience significantly more cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events than those with the antagonist. In prostate cancer, patients with existing cardiovascular disease selecting ADD therapy may differentially affect, or that it, what you use may differentially affect cardiac outcomes. Liver disease is something we haven't heard a whole lot about. Well, in September 2018, in the Journal of Urology, liver disease in men undergoing angin deprivation therapy for prostate cancer. Bottom line, 37.5% of men received ADT. They were more likely to be diagnosed with non-alcoholic non -alcoholic fatty liver disease, hazard ratio of 1.54, liver cirrhosis, liver necrosis, and any liver disease and a dose-response relationship was observed between the number of ADT doses given and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Conclusions, ADT in men with prostate cancer is associated with a diagnosis of non-alcoholic liver disease. And this is the actual uh, slide which shows it's basically a propensity-adjusted hazard ratios for the development of all of the things I just mentioned. What about cardiovascular disease risk in ADT in patients with localized prostate cancer? Another prospective study, which was published in 2017. And this was, <coughs> they, it was a large Californian healthcare system, newly diagnosed localized prostate cancer, patients who initially underwent active surveillance, followed through 2010. Uh, there were 7,637 men, approximately 30% were exposed to ADT. Multiversion analysis, ADT was associated with an increased risk of heart failure. Adjusted hazard ratio of 1.81 in men without pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Elevated risks of arrhythmia and conduction disorders were only observed among patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Conclusion, in men with clinically localized prostate cancer, ADT is associated with a greater risk of heart failure in men without any pre-existing cardiovascular disease and an increased risk of arrhythmia and conduction disorder was noted in men with pre-existing disease. Antagonists were not available on the formulary at the time this study was done. So what about third generation antiandrogens? Elderly patients over 65 years of age, and by that I mean abiraterone and enzalutamide. Elderly patients over 65 years with advanced prostate cancer and cardiovascular disease are often excluded from clinical trials. Particularly, they were excluded, well, there wasn't a lot of them in, in the abiraterone or enzalutamide trials. Consequently, we don't know much about the effects of these medications on patients. So studies are needed. And this was a study from Liu Yao, Grace Liu Yao, which was basically published in 2019 in European Neurology. And it was, they wanted to assess the short-term outcomes of abiraterone acetate and enzalutamide in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. 
A po it was a population-based retrospective study using SEER-linked database to identify prostate cancer patients who had received either of these two agents. The outcome, six months all cores mortality adjusted using modified Poisson regression modeling of a relative risk adjusted for, com for co confounders and comorbidities. It showed that after treatment with either of these agents, older patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease had higher short-term mortality than similar patients without cardiovascular disease. Mortality did not depend on having received abiraterinacetate versus enzalutamide. They both caused it. The bottom line is that cardiovascular disease is a real entity in ADT. When you make a patient castrate, you increase their likelihood of getting into cardiac problems. What you induce that with is where there may be some subtle differences, and they may be quite large. Thanks very much for listening.